Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. John on this sixth Sunday after Pentecost, this Independence Day. Uh, just one announcement, next Sunday between services we have a going away reception for all of our staff, either who's retiring or uh, moving on from St. John uh, Lutheran School uh, for the year ahead. So that's between services next Sunday. Uh, those are all the announcements that I have. So we'll begin with our opening hymn, 905, Come Thou Almighty King, 905. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will claim our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, during his earthly ministry, your son Jesus healed the sick and raised the dead. By the healing medicine of the word and sacraments, pour into our hearts such love towards you that we may live eternally. Through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the sixth Sunday after Pentecost is from Ezekiel chapter 2. And he said to me, Son of man, Stand on your feet, 
and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are also impudent and stubborn. I send you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. And whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We recite responsively Psalm 123. I lift up my eyes to you, to you whose throne is in heaven. Have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us, for we have endured much contempt. We have endured much ridicule from God, much contempt from the arrogant. We have endured much ridicule from God, much contempt from the arrogant. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forevermore. Amen. The epistle is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I must go on boasting, though there's nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who, 14 years ago, was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast, but on my own half, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though, if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So, to keep me from being too elated by the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the Alleluia verse. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Jesus went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. 
and he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. We stand together and confess the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the hymn of the day, Christmas in July. What child is this? 370.
Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Amen. Well, I come before you today with a timeless conundrum, with an age-old question, a perennial issue that sparks debates and arguments every year. To some, the idea brings joy to the world. To others, it brings out their inner grin. The question at hand, how early is too early to listen to Christmas music? <laughs> now, some of you want to hear Christmas songs in December. Others would be happy to listen to it all year long. Last year, I think I started to hear Christmas songs in October. My own opinion, which is the right one, of course, is that <laughs> one should wait until after Thanksgiving. But this year, I'm changing. I'm getting ahead of the curve. We're starting in July. Christmas in July, so Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> now you may be wondering why we just sang What Child Is This, a Christmas hymn on this 4th of July weekend. Well, I don't have my holidays mixed up, but I wanted this particular song for our hymn of the day because of the simple question that it asks. What child is this? In other words, who is this child? Who is this baby who, laid to rest on Mary's lap, is sleeping? Who is this whom angels greet with anthems sweet? The lyrics inquire as to who Jesus is, and the lyrics, in turn, answer the question by proclaiming who he really is. He's the babe, the son of Mary. He's Christ the King. He's the Word made flesh and the King of kings. This is who that child was. This is who Jesus is. The hymn's question, what child is this, pertains to today's gospel reading. For in Mark 6, a similar question is asked of Jesus. People who encounter Jesus react to him, wondering just exactly who he is. We see this in the gospel text as Jesus returns to his hometown. People who knew Jesus personally essentially asked, who is this guy? But the question as to who Jesus is has been a theme running throughout Mark's gospel. Mark immediately sets the stage of his gospel by explicitly telling us who this Jesus is in the first verse of his book. He says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So right away, Mark declares to us who Jesus is. He is the Christ, the Son of God. And throughout the Gospel, Mark further fills in the picture of who the Son of God really is as Jesus goes about his ministry, preaching, teaching, healing, and casting out demons. Mark answers the question of who Jesus is by showing us Jesus, recording his words and his actions. As people then encounter the Son of God, often wondering who exactly he is, they react to him in different ways. Some respond to him in faith. Others respond to him in disbelief. Several weeks ago, we saw in Mark 3 that Jesus' own family thought he was crazy. And the scribes believed him to be possessed by a demon. So who is Jesus? His family would say that he's a crazy man. The scribes would call him a demoniac in league with Satan. At the end of Mark 4, the, the, the disciples asked the question, Who then is this? After witnessing Jesus calm a tremendous storm on the Sea of Galilee. So who is Jesus? The disciples would say he's a man with terrifying power over the wind and sea. In the first part of Mark 5, Jesus encounters a Gentile man possessed by a legion of unclean spirits. The demons react to Jesus in fear, yelling out, What do you have to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? And Jesus casts out the demons who enter a herd of pigs that run off a cliff and drown. Following this, the restored man wants to remain with Jesus. But the owners of the pigs and the people from the surrounding area beg Jesus to depart from them. So who is Jesus? Well, to the demons who actually get it right, he's the son of the Most High God. 
For the former demoniac, Jesus is someone to be with and to follow. To the herdsmen and people from the area, he's someone to be afraid of and should leave them immediately. Last week, in the latter part of Mark 5, we again saw several reactions to Jesus. There was Jairus falling at Jesus' feet, begging him to heal his daughter. There was also the woman with the issue of blood who timidly touched Jesus that she might be healed. Both believed Jesus had the power to heal. And after Jairus' daughter died, Jesus informed the crowd that she wasn't dead, but only sleeping. And the people reacted by laughing at him. So who is Jesus? To the crowd, he's one who makes preposterous claims about dead people, someone to make fun of. To the woman and Jairus' family, he's one who shows compassion and gives healing and life. And then we arrive at today's text in Mark chapter 6. Jesus returns to his hometown of Nazareth, and on the Sabbath day, he's in the synagogue teaching. And the folks in his hometown have a sharp reaction to him. At first, they're astonished, but then their astonishment turns into offense. Mark records the reaction to Jesus as they began keeping up questions against him, and notes the familiarity and contempt in their questions when Mark states, Many who heard Jesus were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters with us? And they took offense at him. Who is Jesus? Who is this guy? To the people of Nazareth, he's just a carpenter. He's just Mary's son. He's just the elder sibling of his brothers and sisters. They're wondering just who this guy thinks he is. Just how in the world is he able to do miracles? Where did he get his so-called wisdom? How is he able to preach and teach God's word? How can a carpenter do such things? And behind their questions lies disdain and scorn. I can imagine what was going through their minds. I remember this Jesus. He was that kid running up and down the streets of Nazareth with all the other kids. Isn't this the carpenter who fixed my door and made our table? What's so special about him? Hey, we grew up together. Does he think he's better than us? Hey, wasn't Jesus the kid that was born under questionable circumstances? Wasn't his mom pregnant before she got married? Who is this guy? Who does he think he is? Now, throughout Mark, we've seen people reject Jesus for various reasons. Some thought he was insane. Others accused him of being demon-possessed. Some were terrified of him. Others mocked him. But here in his hometown, his people aren't rejecting him so much for anything he's done, but for who he is. After all, they all know him. At least they think they know him. They know him as just a normal guy from Nazareth. They lived with him, worked with him, and grew up with him. They've known him his whole life. For them, familiarity is breeding contempt. The people of Nazareth like familiar Jesus. They like the Jesus that made tables and bookshelves for them. They like Jesus with his brothers and sisters. But they have contempt for this guy who preaches the gospel to them. They scorn the one who teaches on his own authority. They disdain the one who brings with him the kingdom of God. And so Mark notes that the people were offended by him. They were scandalized by God in the flesh standing before them. And they reject the Son of God. And while Mark states the people were astonished at Jesus, he also notes that Jesus, too, was astonished. Jesus marveled because of their unbelief. Jesus was astonished at their lack of faith. As I've said, Mark is grappling with the theme of who Jesus is, and he's showing us that there's only two responses to Jesus, faith or disbelief. 
And as the Christian church, we too grapple with the theme of who Jesus is. As Christians, we're constantly wrestling with what it means that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and how that impacts and shapes our lives as God's people in this fallen world. For just as the people of Nazareth were scandalized by who Jesus was, in our sinful natures, we're also scandalized by who Jesus is. Our sinful hearts, which wants to cling to every possible idol instead of clinging to Jesus, are confronted with Christ in the word and sacrament ministry of the church. The false Jesus that we make in our own image is confronted with the real, crucified and risen Christ. For people like a familiar Jesus. They like the Jesus made in their own image. The people of Nazareth liked carpenter Jesus. They didn't like Jesus claiming to be the Son of God and calling them to repentance and belief in him. And we also like a familiar Jesus. We like a Jesus that conforms to our image, to a Jesus as we want him to be. We like a Jesus that is a great teacher or a moral ethicist. We like a Jesus that approves of our lifestyles. We like a Jesus who justifies our actions. We like a Jesus who, so, who supports our politics. We like a Jesus who really is okay with our sin, who really doesn't care what we do in this life as long as we don't hurt anyone. We don't like Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We don't like Jesus bringing us into his kingdom. We don't like Jesus calling us to repentance, calling us to confess our sin and turn away from our sin. We don't like Jesus exhorting us to be perfect, as our Heavenly Father is perfect. We don't like Jesus commanding us to live as his people. We don't like Jesus commanding us to love our enemies, to lead sexually pure and decent lives, to honor the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, to honor our authorities, and so on. And we especially don't like Jesus on the cross. We don't like Jesus dying specifically for us, specifically for our sins. The cross is offensive, and we take offense at the cross. I like carpenter Jesus. I don't like Jesus claiming to be the Son of God and calling me to repentance and belief in him. There are only two responses to Jesus, faith and disbelief. So who is Jesus? When the people of Nazareth rejected Jesus, he did not give up on his ministry. He didn't change his message. He didn't go crawling back to them, begging them to follow him. He simply marveled at their unbelief and went elsewhere to preach the good news concerning himself. In fact, in the wake of, of his rejection, Jesus sent out the twelve disciples to proclaim the same message, the good news of Jesus. And following his resurrection, these apostles continued to proclaim the message of Jesus. And they proclaimed it in the face of violent opposition. They proclaimed the message of who Jesus was and who he is as the crucified and risen Lord. They proclaimed the love of God and the forgiveness of sins precisely for those who in their sin have rejected God. By sharing what Jesus has accomplished for them in, their, in his life, death, and resurrection. A key to, under, to answering the question of who Jesus is, is to look at what Jesus did. Jesus is the one who goes after those who reject him. Jesus is the one who sent out his disciples to proclaim the good news to the world. He is the one who forgives our sins and takes away our guilt. He is the one who died that we might live. He is the one who has given us his Holy Spirit that we might believe in him and be saved. He is the one who restores our relationship with, the, with God the Father by giving us his righteousness. While in our sinfulness we have rejected the Son of God, the Son of God has not rejected us. He has made us his own, claiming us, giving us himself, that we might be forgiven and have life in his name. So who is this guy? Who is Jesus? Returning to our Christmas in July hymn, verse 2 of What Child Is This beautifully tells us who Jesus is 
by proclaiming what Jesus did for us. Nails, spear shall pierce him through, the cross be born for me, for you. Hail, hail, the word made flesh, the babe, the son of Mary. Jesus is the one who bore the cross for you and for me. This is who Jesus is. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, the Son of God. Amen. Continue worship this time by gathering our tithes and offerings. We ask you to fill up the attendance cards, letting us know who you are. Continue with the prayers of the church, uh, an announcement, a positive one. This doesn't always happen, but if your brother tells me just before the service that it's today's your birthday, uh, we rejoice with all those who celebrate birthdays, especially today with uh, Peggy Rohde. So, happy birthday, and we celebrate the good gifts that God gives. Let us pray. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, your Son endured rejection in this world, and yet through your Holy Scriptures, through your Holy Spirit, we know and confess what child this is, the one who is the Son of God, the Son of Man, who is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. 
And as we seek to faithfully follow him, to respond to his call to discipleship, we pray and trust that you lead us likewise through a hostile world that shows no honor to your church or its wisdom. Do not let us lose heart. Steal us for opposition. And let us rest confidently, confidently on what you, Lord, have said. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, your great and mighty work is to create faith by your Holy Spirit in the eternal blessings of your Son, Jesus Christ. And so we implore you, make your preachers effective to proclaim your prophetic word. And remove all stubborn ears from our midst. Do not leave us without your word, but make your home among us. Abide with us and restore to us the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, soften the hearts in every home. Turn parents and children toward each other in love and patience. Banish the spirit of impudence, and stubbornness, and rebellion from all of your children, and sanctify us in your truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, on this Independence Day, we pray that you would protect and defend our nation from its enemies, support our leaders, and preserve them from temptation. Through the work of all civil authorities, enable us as citizens to live a quiet and peaceable life according to your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O gracious Lord, in our weakness, we are strong for the sake of Christ, whose grace is sufficient for every need. Help us to know and trust this. Give comfort to those whose pain is chronic, whose sustained suffering is unknown, who wrestle with difficult thorns in body or mind, or who are tempted to despair. Today especially we bring before your throne of grace those who grieve. We pray especially for Steve Wilson and his family as he mourns the death of his sister Debbie. We pray for Dana Wamsgans and her family as she mourns the death of her dad, Don. We lift up all those who are being treated for cancer and those who care for them. Specifically, we pray for Kathy and Jim, Rick, Tom, Paul and Rebecca, for all those who have health concerns, for those who have any kind of need. We thank you also for the many good blessings that you give us. We celebrate this week with Peggy Rohde and her family, or today on her, the anniversary of her birth. We thank you that you have gathered your people close to you, for all those saints who have gone before. This week we rejoice that Steve Bolden is with the church triumphant. And we thank you that as we, the church militant, come together in prayer, you hear and answer those prayers. And so in weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, let us all boast in Christ and his cross, by which we and our sufferings are sanctified. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, out of your abundant blessing, you satisfy us with Christ, the bread of life. Give repentance and faith to all who commune this day, that finding refuge in your Son's true body and blood, we may taste and see that you are good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit and will return one day, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We continue now with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing.
Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
don't have to wonder, you know what child this is, you know who he is, Jesus, and you've just received his body and blood. So this eating and drinking of Christ's body and blood strengthen you and preserve you in both body and soul until life everlasting. Depart in the peace of Christ. Amen. We sing the post-communion canticle. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And on this Independence Day, we join together in praying the collect or prayer for our nation. Let us pray together. Almighty God, you have given us this good land as our heritage. Grant that we remember your generosity and constantly do your will. Bless our land with honest industry, truthful education, and an honorable way of life. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil course of action. Grant that we, who came from many nations with many different languages, may become a united people. Support us in defending our liberties and give those to whom we have entrusted the authority of government, the spirit of wisdom, that there may be justice and peace in our land. When our times are prosperous, May our hearts be thankful, and in troubled times, do not let our trust in you fail. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.